Whilst we might think that success and achievement are mostly related to the talent of an individual and somehow some people are just happen to be born with that magic gene, in this book Angela Duckworth argues that success and achievement are more related or correlated to this special combination of passion and perseverance, something that she refers to as grit, which is indeed the title of the book. Hey friends, welcome to the very first episode of Book Club, a session where I walk you through some of my favorite books and discover together how we can apply the insights and the lessons and the learnings from these great authors and how we can apply them in the workplace. Let's have a look today to see how we can implement grit, as Angela Duckworth calls it, into our workplace and how we can create an amazing culture based upon some of these insights. So buckle up. So the book starts with the story of the US Military Academy at West Point back in 2004, which has an incredibly grueling selection process already. But despite they still had at that time a relatively high dropout rate. So the author went over there to actually have a look and say what was the difference between those people that actually stayed the course and those people that actually dropped out. And what she found was to her surprise was it was not to do with their physical prowess or how intelligent they were or to any other factor such as talent related factor as we might think about it. What it was really came down to was what she referred to as having this never give up at how they had this real meaning and they had this real purpose behind what they were actually doing. But the question is now for you and me is how can we grow or how can we generate this never give up attitude? We've all had this at times in the past but how can we actually go about actually creating this not just in the workplace but also in our lives as well? So what is grit? So how Angela Duckworth explains this is, is that it's a combination of two things. One, passion. People who are clear, so clear and driven on what they really wanted. And the second one was on perseverance. So people that were willing to be consistent and here's the key bit, without any gratification for an extended period of time. And that's where a lot of us fall over. Where we have that positive feedback loop of, of gratification, continuing to do something is really easy, right? Um, but it's where, that, where there is that absence of that positive feedback loop and where we need to uh, dig deep and actually have that willpower and that perseverance to continue. That's basically the second element of perseverance that when you have this passion and this perseverance, they come together, go to form this idea, this concept that, that is called grit. The problem is, is, is that we're distracted by an obsession with talent. We want to believe people have these unique gifts. We want to believe that they have these special talents. And basically as a result of that, the vast majority of us, based upon the, what the author claims, is, is that most of us are basically only half awake. We're like these kind of zombies, or in other words, we're only using a small part of our uh, potential, a small part of our mental and our physical resources. Of course, there are always limits to our, our potential. But the point is, or the argument is, is, is that we don't get anywhere near to our real, what our real potential actually is. So in summary, the focus on talent really does distract us from the key differentiator. And that key differentiator is actually the amount of effort that we put in. The, the argument is, is that effort actually counts for twice or double of impact as talent. Uh, based upon this formula. As Will Smith has said famously, there's a separation between talent and skill. Talent is basically your God-given gift. This is something that you were born with. This was in your genome, right? This is something, this is like kind of like your height. You have what you have and there's not a lot you can do about that, okay? So that is your talent. That is your God-given gift. On the other hand, there is this idea of skill. Now, skill only comes about by taking that talent that you have and applying effort onto that, and that results in skill. Now, what Angela Duckworth says is that talent times effort equals skill, but effort counts twice because we then take that skill and when we apply even more effort onto the skill that we have now generated, we now get results, okay? Let's take the example of Michael Jordan then. So an elite level athlete. 
So even Michael Jordan, with all of his raw talent, got cut in high school in the high school draft. And it wasn't until he took that talent that he had and he applied enough effort into it that it created enough skill for him to start to perform at the highest level. Once he had created and honed that skill over years and years and years of beating on his craft, then he was able to apply the effort in those key clutch moments during the matches and then he was able to create those extraordinary results that he actually did. So in this way, effort actually counts for twice the multiplier effect of talent. As Coach Anson says in the book, talent is common. What you invest to develop that talent is the critical final measure of greatness. Okay, so that's all very nice and found this actually quite encouraging as I was reading through it for mere mortals such as myself that the most important thing is effort. And this is not a new concept, but the way in which the author explained it was very powerful and very impactful for myself at least anyway. And the next question is, is that, okay, so if that is the case, then first question is how gritty am I? And then the next question is, is there anything I can do about it? So let's cover the first question now in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. So if you look at the screen, what you see over here is some descriptions, some characteristics that the authors put together, together with some numbers and some scorings against each of those characteristics to see how well you fare. So for example, new ideas and projects sometimes distract me from previous ones. I'm gonna say probably for me, somewhat like me probably is, is, is fair. Setbacks don't discourage me. I don't usually easily give up. I think I do get a little bit discouraged. So let's just say, um, but I don't normally give up. So I'll, I'll say, I'll, give, I'll be kind to myself. I'll give myself a four on that. I often set myself a goal, but later choose to pursue a different one. I think um, that is not much like me. Okay. So I have a four on that one. Uh, I'm a hard worker, I think I am. So I've got four on there. I have difficulty maintaining my focus on projects that take more than a few months to complete. Guilty is charged. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to put myself as a three on that one. I finish whatever I begin. Again, probably a three over there. Uh, my interests change from year to year. Yeah, I mean, that is true. You would hope so. I mean, you know, one, all of you guys believe, know, hopefully, that I'm an agilist and I love uh, uh, and I believe that we need to all be able to change and improve and grow. So that is something I don't actually agree that that's negative. Um, maybe the author means that the passions, the things that you really, truly love. Is that such a bad thing? I'm not so sure. Leave your comments below. Um, so I put myself down quite low for that. So I'm a two, mostly like me, I would say. Yes, they do change from year to year. Um, I'm diligent. I never give up. Uh, kind of a four, mostly like me, I'd say. I have been obsessed with a certain idea of project for a short time, but lost later interest. Yeah, I would say yes, that is somewhat like me, definitely. Okay. And I have to overcome setbacks to conquer an important challenge. Yeah, that's mostly like me. Yeah. Um, so overall, my score that that is um, it, you tally up, you add up all of your score. And then what you do is you divide that by 10. Um, and my score comes to a pretty um, a rather pathetic 3.4, which means I'm in the lower percentile of grittiness, which is not particularly <laughs> encouraging. But hey, look, we have a growth mindset. Right. And that's the idea. That's the point. We, we acknowledge where we are, we, we look at our weaknesses, we accept where we are, and then we move on from there, right? And that is the, that is the, that is the actual point. And I think also the, the important thing is, is that, of course, you know, the, the man-child within me wants to be five out of five, but you also got to work out, uh, this is one scale of many that you could measure yourself on as well. So I think that uh, it's a good measure. And I'd like to see myself improve the measures that I agree with, which I agree with the vast majority of them. I'm still questioning the interest because I think it's healthy to develop interest from year to year. OK, so how do you fare? What you can do is you can download this spreadsheet and put your own numbers in there and leave your results in the comments if you're brave enough to do that. And uh, let me know what your insights on that. What your plans are for improving that. If you want to know how we can improve your grittiness, then keep watching because that's coming up 
in the next section. All right, so we've learned how gritty we are or we're not in my case. All right, and then what we're going to do now is we're going to look at how, what does the author, what does the author say that we need to have in place to, uh, uh, to enhance and to become more gritty, okay? Okay, so how do we become more gritty is one of the three stage process and the first step is developing an interest, okay? So the general advice is, is that obvious, and it is sound kind of obvious to some degrees, is the more we love something, the more we're passionate about something, the more we're excited about something, the more likely we are to be gritty, we're, i.e. we're to, to, to have passion for that and persevere persevere in that endeavor okay so basically if you love something you're going to keep doing it right so that's fairly straightforward right however i think the insight for me over here was is that basically it doesn't always fall in your lap right so so um she gives the uh, example over here of rowdy Gaines, who i hadn't heard before but was apparently a gold medalist olympic swimmer um, and before he discovered uh, his passion of swimming he tried a number of different sports let me just see which ones they are football baseball, basketball, golf, tennis, and then he finally got to swim. I'm sure I probably would have given up well before I said, I'm not an athlete, find something else. So there's an example of um, somebody pursuing your the interests and looking for them, right? So the idea is, is that interests don't just fall in your lap and they're not there through introspection. Rather, they're triggered by um, interactions with the outside world. So go explore, find your passion, and keep be a hunter, be a be a hunter, looking around, trying to find out what it is that really excites you and gets you up and gets you excited in the morning. Okay, so that's the message of the first thing. So there's a there's a formula that's given in the book over here. So uh, let's have a quick look at that. Right. So in a series of questions, you can ask yourself, what do I like to think about? Where does my mind wander? What do I really care about? What matters most to me? How do I enjoy spending my time? And what do I find absolutely unbearable? Okay, so now that's kind of going to point you hopefully in the right direction for that. I've got a uh, download as well. No email necessary. You can click on the link over there and you can download a cheat sheet with all of this uh, stuff over there for you just to make things easy for you. All right, so that's point number one. Now the next thing is, is that what we do is, is to improve the second thing the first thing to improve our, our grittiness is to develop the right interest. And then the second one is once we've done that is to use deliberate practice. So what do we mean by deliberate practice? So let me just give an example myself. Um, so, uh, for example, if I'm driving my car, now I've been driving a car for a number of years, but that doesn't make me Lewis Hamilton, right? Because why? Because I get in my car and I drive from A to B. I'm not trying to become a racing car driver. I'm not trying to, to uh, become an elite uh, professional, right? Um, and so as a result of that, my, my yes, hopefully over time, I've become a safer driver or able to respond to adverse situations in, in a better manner, more efficiently, more effectively, but it doesn't make me a racing car driver. So, and so this is where deliberate practice comes in, is where we're constantly pushing the boundaries of what our capability are. We're in that stretch zone, that uncomfortable zone. What you see over here in this diagram over here is that you see on the one hand you see skill and you see time. And there is a curve that of ex excellence, I'll just call it that, right? So there's a curve of excellence over here. So where you have like an average individual on, on, on a, a learning a skill that they're not necessarily particularly that interested in or, or passionate about, then you see that they kind of plateau over here on this lower curve. But where you look at where the world-class athletes and world-class professionals or people are world-class in any, any endeavor, what you see is a different curve where they're actually, whilst of course there's always some level of, of plateauing, but it's far higher up the skill curve where that plateauing actually occurs. So what we what we get, Angela's given four very useful stages over here for deliberate practice. Uh, again, in the cheat sheet, which you can download. Okay, so step number one, you need to clearly define what that goal is. Now that goal has to be beyond your current uh, capability right so it's going to be uncomfortable right and that's the zone you kind of need to get your your head around in being comfortable in that zone okay the second thing is you want to put in full concentration and effort whilst you're actually doing the task so you're not just you know swanning into whatever task you're actually doing you're really putting in you're really focusing and you're really putting that dedication and effort into that now 
you don't want to be scared of that immediate and informative feedback. Now, if, let's just say I'm trying to lose weight, right? Now, sometimes if I've eaten, <laughs> if I've been a bit naughty for a few days, I'm going to not want to go near that weighing scale, right? And that's just natural. But it's the discipline of, of seeking and actually wanting that feedback so that that keeps me on track and that keeps me sharp and that keeps me, you know, that keeps me hopefully on track. Okay, and then it's repetition with reflection and refinement. This is the essence, guys. Agilists out there, this is the essence of, of um, agility, right? You have a stretch goal, which is beyond your current capability. You work on it with focus and dedication. You measure how you're doing, and then you continuously improve, right? So this is the focus. This is what we should be living and breathing in any case, right? So this should be hopefully for, for a lot of you agilists out there, this should be sort of like um, something that should be feel very natural to you. But what is, uh, what is theory and what is actual practice in the, in, in the real world and applying that to different aspects of our lives, I think that is the challenge for all of us where we actually do this with a greater level of intentionality than perhaps we may have done in the past. Okay, grit grows through hope. Look, if you believe you're, in essence, if you believe you're likely to achieve something, you're much more likely to put the effort in to do it. If I think, well, I don't know if it's going to happen or it's not going to happen, you know, then I'm much more likely to sort of like pack up, pack my bags and give up much too early, right? If I really have that hope and that belief that it can happen uh, and that perseverance, then I'm much more likely to continue when the going gets tough and when it gets hard. So that's another thing over there. Now, the so what are some of the underlying aspects of that? So one of the things that Angela's talked about in this book is, is that uh, the growth mindset is essential for developing that hope. Because if you believe that you can learn and you can improve and you can grow and you can get better, then you're more likely to be able to be more perseverant, okay? The next thing is your optimistic self-talk, right? How, what in, inner communication do you have to yourself? Are you accepting, are you encouraging yourself as you go along or are you continuously beating yourself up? Now, if you've got a, a very negative self-talk, then that's gonna, that's gonna be like, you know, that, that's gonna count against you, right? And you're not gonna wanna do it. Subconsciously, uh, we are actually just big children, right? Um, so, so in many ways, if you're beating yourself up all of the time, or in a lot of cases when you're doing poorly, which you will be doing if you are actually endeavoring, if you're actually, if you're really pushing yourself and you actually found a skill that you love, but you're not very good at, then you're gonna have a period of time when you just kind of, frankly, you're just gonna suck at it, right? Okay, and so, and so that is the reality. Now, if you're continuously beating yourself up during that process, which everyone will need to go through in the beginning of learning a new skill, then you're much less likely to actually continue. And this is what Angela says is that where you've got hope and you actually have that growth mindset and you couple that with a positive um, inner narration, then you've got a much better uh, chance of actually seeing uh, the task actually through as well and persevering over adversity as she calls it. Okay, so the final thing that I want to talk about is um, is around culture. And so this is all this is all really great. And um, the question is 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 that how do we take these ideas, how do we take these concepts of grit, of passion and of perseverance and start to build this into our culture at work. So if we're in an agile team, or if we're in a, a, an agile release train, or even if we're not, right? I mean, regardless of the methodology approach you want to be using, right? This is something that everybody will benefit from and can benefit from. And of course, if you ask any individual, would you rather work in an environment which is, is full of passion, is full of direction, you know, um, you've got people that are achieving something great, or would you like to work in an environment that is the opposite of that? Most people would say that they would want to work, I'm guessing, I hope, that in, in an environment full of passion and perseverance. And, and grit, uh, uh, as they say, right? But the question is, is that how do we go about actually creating that? So there are a couple of quite interesting insights over here that I gleaned from the book that I'd like to share with you. Okay, so the first thing is the example of um, uh, Randy Gaines. 
Okay, so the real way to become a great swimmer is to surround yourself with great other great swimmers. Okay, so because there's this what she refers to as this dual causality between a great team and an individual, and they feed each other in this kind of virtuous, positive uh, circle, if you like. All right, eat support in the other to get better. So when you go to a place, right, and the example I gave is when you go to a place where everybody's getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning. I know this. I'm a product of a boarding school. I went to boarding school after year six. And uh, basically everybody would be up there at four o'clock. And that was just what you did. And if you didn't get up, you'd get in big trouble, right? And so that's what I did. And it was just very normal and there was nothing fancy about it. And now even till today, I find it relatively straightforward to get up at four o'clock in the morning. Why? Because that's just become, that was who I was hanging around when I was younger, right? Okay. Um, so you don't need that much discipline if everybody else is doing it, right? So there's this idea of basically conformity, a psychological, um, the argument is, is that there is a psychological need for conformity that we have that is in fact very much more powerful than individual discipline can be, right? So we want to tap into that and we can tap into that by by one, bringing on great people into the team that have the kind of mindset and the culture that we want to bring in, but also over time grow that within the team so you have this positive cycle that, that, that happens. So the other thing is, is that uh, how do we build this uh, team communication or this uh, team culture or this organizational culture? And to take the example from, from, uh, from the business, from JP Morgan, and also from the Seattle Seahawks, or from the sports world as well. And effectively it boils down to three kind of lessons. So the first one is about relentless communication. An example over here is given by, from JP Morgan. And so they talk about what they're really passionate and what their real values actually are over here, right? And so here's an example. And I, I actually was reading this for the first time. I find them uh, really nice. I actually thought they were really, um, uh, uh, I felt a nice feeling when I was reading this. So, so here's some excerpts from the JP Morgan manual. Okay, so I'm not endorsing, uh, I'm not promoting or, or the opposite of that for JP Morgan. It's just an example that was in the book. Okay, so have a fierce resolve in everything that you do. I think that's a pretty good idea. I think, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, I kind of know that. Right. I hope you, you know, we kind of know that. Um, but I did appreciate reading that again. Right. It kind of went from the back of my mind to the front of my mind. So having a fierce resolve in everything that you do, demonstrate determination, resiliency and tenacity. Don't let temporary setbacks become permanent excuses. Ooh, I thought that was that was quite powerful for me. Use mistakes and problems as opportunities to get better not to quit okay so etc and it goes on so i like this and this immediately brought to mind one of the my favorite quotes from uh, uh from jim ron which was don't wish it was easier wish you were better right and i love that quote because it embodies so much about you know this ease culture that we all are uh, create and are subject to and are influenced by and create to some degree responsible for um where actually the opposite of that is what we should be seeking, right? We don't should be seeking ease. We should be seeking greater skill, greater talent, greater strength, greater resilience, greater grit, right? Okay. Um, so if you want to uh, have a great culture, you you want to make sure that that the team understands, has their values over there. But how do you make sure it's not just a whole bunch of words that are just sitting in a book and a file or on a wall somewhere that people roll their eyes as they walk past, right? So that's the question. And so the argument over here is, is that we want to get the team to internalize that. And we do that by getting them to remember it and to recall that. And so I thought, thought that it's, that's a very uh, interesting point because we want to make sure that we can ask ourselves how we can embed that into our day-to-day working practices right okay so how, if we've got this idea and is we want to have a fierce resolve in everything we do how would that manifest itself in our retrospectives and when we're creating something right and we want to remind each other remind the teams and actually i would encourage you build it into your um into your retrospectives ask yourself what kind of questions we want to ask to do with your values right i think that could be a good idea although it's not noted in the book, but it's something that you could think about. Any other ideas you guys have? How can we internalize some of the values there? It would be good to see what you th your thinking is in the comments. 
Okay, and the second point now is incorporating the right model. And again, this is an example that's come from, from the West Point uh, Military Academy. And over here, there has been a drop from, uh, there has been a drop from 12% 40 years ago to just 2% attrition rate now. And that's apparently without making the, the course any easier or doing any cheating or anything like that, okay? Um, and so what this has been put down to is basically a shift in the model, which I found rather, rather interesting. Okay, so apparently before there was this thing called an attrition model. It's kind of like, um, you know, the uh, survival of the fittest, basically, is probably the easiest way to think about it, right? So if you're good enough, you make it. If not, you're out, get out. Basically, that kind of um, harsh Darwinian kind of uh, mindset or, or philosophy, if you like, all right? And then that shifted to more what is what they're referring to as a development model, right? And so that is a little bit more what I would consider to be a more agile, more caring, more um, uh, uh, more growth mindset um, uh, compatible uh, culture, if you think. And that is the following, right? So say, for example, I'm not doing particularly well um, at any task. What, I what would happen is rather than saying, hey, you're rubbish, you're out, what, would act, what they would actually do is it's, they'd have a conversation with me and say, hey, okay, Ahmed, you've not done so well in this part. You've done pretty good over here. This bit is missing. We want you to actually, uh, we're going to give you this coaching. We're going to give you this mentor. This person's really great at doing this thing. Why don't you pair with them? Why don't you work with them? And they would actually have more of a developmental model, right? So they would hold my hand or hold your hand and walk you through that, which I felt was um, uh, a, a, a great um, concept that I think we can bring into our workplace as well. Right. So where individuals are, are we can, what kind of mentorship programs do we have? What kind of uh, help can we give them? What kind of um, and how can we be more proactive to do that uh, rather than have this attrition model? Now, I'm sure most people, most cultures wouldn't actually say we've got this kind of Darwinian attrition model in place. But in actual fact, if truth be told, I've always seen a strong element of that. Right. Um, and so maybe if we shift more towards a developmental model in our organizations, it could be something that we should we should actually consider. The other important or interesting, the third important thing that is talked about is what's called the social multiplier effect. Right. And, and so it goes something like this. Right. It's something that I referred to uh, a little bit earlier. So one person's grit positively impacts the rest of the teams, which then it, uh, positively impacts each individual within the team and so you have this what they refer to as this social multiplier effect where the where the team start to get grittier and grittier and grittier and you have this positive um, uh, virtuous circle of grit if you like okay um, so in summary um, I love this book I thought it was great um, I recommend it to everybody in the workplace wants to develop more passion for what you're doing more perseverance and i recommend it for you if you're in an agile team if you're a scrum master or if you're a least trained engineer to give it to your teams as well and i think it's uh, and i think it's something that you know agile teams could benefit from right so in summary grit is more important than talent right and the great news is you can test your grit using the link below and you can also uh, you can also improve and grow your grit as well Okay, using the techniques we've talked about. And basically you can do that from the inside out. So you can do it through better internal chatter, through a better mindset, through habits of continuously uh, uh, putting stretch goals that are continuously stretching you. And you can connect to your purpose um, and help people beyond yourself as well. And you can also do it from the outside in. You can put yourself in environments where you can excel. You can do organizational design that can actually help with your grittiness as well. And you can have teachers and trainers and mentors and friends that can actually help you with that, right? Thanks very much. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, look forward to seeing you in the next book club series. Thanks very much. Goodbye.